Welcome to this PowerPoint presentation on attribution theory. Prior to the 1960s, social psychologists were interested in the study of things like attitudes and attitude change and group dynamics, including things like conformity and group decision making. But starting in the 1960s and then really picking up steam in the 1970s, the hot topic uh, in social psychology came to be known as social cognition. Uh, social psychologists became interested in what are people thinking when they're making social judgments? How do they make judgments about other people in social situations? How do we know what somebody's personality is like? How do we know what their intentions are? And the primary kind of theory that was developed to explain these kinds of things came to be known as attribution theory. How do we make attributions about people in social situations? Now, whether the judgments we make or not are accurate or not is not usually the issue. Attribution theorists are interested in how we come to the conclusions that we come to, whether or not we're accurate. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this set of slides. I might also add that uh, attribution theorists are not just interested in how we make judgments about others, but how do we draw inferences about our own behavior as well. To the extent that we can identify the beginnings of attribution theory, it would probably be in 1958 when a psychologist named Fritz Heider published a classic book. The title of the book was The Psychology of Interpersonal Relations. You don't really need to remember Heider's name or the title of the book, but I'm just trying to give credit where it's due. Heider was not really an attribution theorist, but his book opened up the questions that attribution theorists would then uh, take up and become interested in in the development of their theories. Heider talked about something that he called naive psychology. He was interested in how the average person on the street who didn't have advanced degrees in psychology made judgments about other people. So how do we draw social conclusions? And let me give you an example of the kinds of questions that Heider was asking. So let's suppose I've given you the assignment to work with a middle school student and uh, teach them to perform some kind of task. And then after you've done your bit, we test that person, see how well the student performs. Well, if the student fails, they don't succeed at the task, one of the things that you need to do is to make a decision as to what was the cause of that failure. Now, it could be that the uh, person you were working with just isn't very smart. They just don't have the ability to learn the thing you were trying to teach them to do. Or maybe they just didn't care and they didn't put in very much effort. So two of the judgments you can make is that they failed because of a lack of ability or because of a lack of effort. Now, look at the diagram on this slide. You'll notice that those two things have something in common. These are both what we would call internal attributions. You're judging that the cause of the person's behavior rests within themselves. The failure on the task can be traced either to their level of ability or to the amount of effort that they put in, but both of these things are internal. Now, you might also say that the person failed the task because uh, the task was just impossible. It was way too difficult. Uh, you gave them some sort of task that no middle school child, no matter how talented and hardworking, is going to be able to successfully do that. So it's not surprising that they failed. So in this case, you would say that it's not really the student's fault. There was something about the task itself that caused the failure to happen. Uh, and so this is an external attribution. You're making a judgment that the result of the behavior uh, stems from something outside of the student's control. Or you could just say it was bad luck. Maybe uh, the student was sick that day or there was some other distressing thing that happened at home that 
uh, prevented them from concentrating. And so it was just bad luck. Uh, it was just a bad day and that's why they failed. So one of the first judgments we have to make about the cause of somebody else's behavior is whether it was caused by internal or external things. But if you look at the horizontal uh, rows here, you'll notice that you can classify these in a different way as well. Some of these things are stable causes, ability and task difficulty. So if we're talking about ability, um, and we'll use IQ as an example, well, you don't wake up one day and have an IQ of 140 and wake up the next day and have an IQ of 75 and wake up the third day and have an IQ of 102. No. Uh, we perceive ability as a fairly fixed thing. Your level of artistic talent or athletic ability or intelligence is something that's pretty stable across time. Similarly, uh, the task that you're asking someone to perform in this example isn't going to change. It's going to be just as hard to design a nuclear submarine tomorrow as it is today. And so we not only have to decide if the cause of a behavior is an internal or external thing, but if it's a stable or an unstable thing. Let's go down to the unstable row. Uh, maybe the kid you were working with didn't put in a lot of effort today, but maybe tomorrow he will. Uh, maybe if you change the way you approach working with the student, you'll get them more motivated. Or the bad luck that happened uh, maybe won't happen tomorrow. So sometimes the perceived causes of behaviors are unstable. And so according to Heider, one of the first things we're doing when we're trying to figure out other people is to figure out whether what we're seeing represents something that's internal or external to the person, or whether it's a stable or unstable cause of behavior. And your attribution is important, right? Because this will determine how you proceed in dealing with that person. In the example of trying to teach the kid to do something, if you perceive that the cause of failure is stable, you're probably not going to work very hard at trying to get them to improve because you perceive that that can't happen. On the other hand, if you perceive that the cause of the failure was due to something unstable, you're probably going to work with them a little more because you know that the outcome can change. I used ability, or I'm sorry, task performance as an example here, but we make these same kinds of judgments when we see somebody behaving badly, when we see them behaving nobly, uh, we immediately try to figure out is what we're seeing here the result of something that tells us about this person or is it something that anybody would do in that situation? So Heider opened the door to the development of attribution theories. There have been dozens of different attribution theories that have been developed over time. I'm just going to tell you about two of the pioneering theories. Uh, the theories of Jones and Davis that were developed in 1965, and uh, some attribution models developed by a psychologist named Harold Kelly. Later attribution theories built upon these early theories, and they're different from them in some ways, but in this course, um, I want you to be familiar with sort of the classic attribution models. And let me start with the model of Jones and Davis, something they called their theory of correspondent inferences. The hardest thing about grasping Jones and Davis's correspondent inferences theory is to understand this concept of correspondence. Correspondence is really the extent to which an act or a behavior and its underlying cause can be described in the same words. So if I see somebody behave in a rude manner and I conclude that this happened because they have a rude personality or they intended to be rude, in that case, I'm making a highly correspondent attribution. The words that I would use to describe the behavior are the very same words that I could also use to describe the underlying causes of that behavior. In a sense, correspondence refers to the confidence we have that a behavior was caused by some underlying trait and intention of the person. And when we're making judgments about other people, we like to make highly correspondent attributions. We like to feel like we know something about that person so we could make good predictions about him or her in the future. And so we seek to be able to explain their behaviors in terms of their personality traits 
or their motivations and intentions. And to the extent that I can do that, if I feel confident that I'm doing that, then I am making a high correspondent attribution. If I'm not sure what the cause of their behavior is, or if I attribute the cause of their behavior to something outside of the person, something external, then I'm making a judgment that's a low in correspondence. So people like to make highly correspondent attributions. So according to Jones and Davis, uh, there are a number of things that determine the level of correspondence that we can make. The first one is the social desirability of effects. Um, effects just mean what the outcomes of the person's behavior are. So let's suppose I'm going into a classroom and I'm going to be lecturing to my new class and there's a student in that class that comes every day and um, somebody asks me, hey, I see so-and-so is in your class. Uh, tell me what you know about that person. Well, if that individual shows up to class, they sit there quietly, they take notes, I don't feel like I have much to say about them because they're doing the socially desirable thing. They're doing what most students would do in that situation. And I don't really feel like I've learned anything that helps me understand them. On the other hand, if this person shows up naked and they sit in the back, facing the back of the room, screaming at the top of their lungs, well, this is a lot of stuff you ought not to be doing. And I am probably gonna make much more confident and much more correspondent judgments about the individual based on that behavior than on the behavior I described previously. So when a person is behaving in a socially desirable way, it doesn't tell me very much because most people would do the same thing. The message here is that we pay especially close attention to non-normative behaviors, uh, behaviors that are out of the ordinary, behaviors that aren't expected. So I look at the screaming naked person and say, my, that's non-normative. And those behaviors become very important in shaping the judgments I make about that person. But when they're sitting there politely taking notes during the lecture, they're doing the socially desirable thing and those behaviors don't help me very much in making a correspondent attribution. So the social desirability of the effects is what matters the most. The next factor would be what we call the degree of hedonic relevance. In other words, how much does the behavior matter to me? So if I'm making a judgment about a student's behavior in my own class, where their behavior can be disruptive to me and mess up what I'm trying to do that day, I'm going to make more highly correspondent judgments about that person than I will in a situation where I'm hearing about this happening in somebody else's class. It just doesn't matter as much to me. So the more involved I am in the behavior of the person, the more it affects me directly, the more likely I am to make highly correspondent judgments about that person. The amount of personalism. Um, this means to what extent is the person's behavior aimed at me in some way? Uh, the higher the personalism is, the more correspondent the judgments I'm going to make are. So, um, for example, let's say I'm walking out of the building after class one day and a student's driving their car and all of a sudden a tire blows out and the car swerves and almost hits me. Well, hedonic relevance is very high there. Uh, what happens with this car as it's hurtling toward me really matters to me. But personalism might be low because I don't perceive that the person is intending to run me down. On the other hand, if I see the student intentionally turning the car in my direction and stepping on the gas and the car is speeding toward me, now, not only is hedonic relevance high, but personalism is high because I'm perceiving that the student is intentionally aiming this behavior at me. So correspondence increases when there's non-normative, not socially desirable behavior, 
when the behavior matters for the person making the judgments and when the behavior is in some way directed at the observer. The last thing on this list uh, is a little harder to explain, the number of non-common effects. Uh, when a person behaves in some way, it has some kind of consequence. And we use these consequences to try to make judgments about the cause of the behavior. So let's take the example of a student trying to select a college. If I described a hypothetical student and said, well, they were trying to decide between college A and college B, and college A was a large state university with a very strong Greek system and a lot of partying, and it's close to home for the student. And then there's another small college uh, where the students are famous for studying a lot. It's not a real party school, uh, and it's far away from where the student lives. And then I tell you which school the student selects. You're going to have trouble knowing what the reason for that selection is, because there are so many things that are different. Did the student pick one school over the other because of its size, because of its location, because of its party atmosphere or lack thereof? You just don't know because the outcomes of the choices have a lot of what we call non-common effects. You get a lot of different things choosing college A versus college B. And because there's so many different possible outcomes, we don't know which one mattered. Now, on the other hand, if they're choosing between two colleges and they're exactly the same right down the line, except for one thing, and we see that the student chooses one college over the other, we now are more confident that that one thing that was different is the thing that made their choice. And so our correspondence, uh, the degree of confidence we have in the judgment we make about them is higher. When the number of non-common effects is low, correspondence will be higher. When there are too many non-common effects, correspondence goes down because it's too hard to know which thing is the cause. Now notice, there has to be at least one non-common effect. If there are two colleges that seem to be exactly the same in every respect, and the student picks one over the other, we're also at a loss there. We don't know what to say. So there has to be at least one non-common effect, but there can't be very many if we're looking to make a correspondent judgment. So let's talk about another uh, kind of attribution theory. And I'm going to talk about a couple of attribution models developed by Harold Kelly. Uh, Kelly's covariation model and Kessel, Kelly's causal schemata model. I'm not going to talk too much about the causal schemata model because in many ways it's very similar to um, Jones and Davis's theory of correspondent inferences. Jones and Davis's theory and Kelly's causal schemata model are both designed to explain how we make judgments about others when we only have one sample of their behavior. We see a behavior happening one time in a specific situation, and these models try to explain the mental processes we go through to make judgments about others in that situation. The covariation model of Kelly, on the other hand, tries to explain how we make judgments about patterns of behavior over time. And I'll return to that in a moment. But let me first talk a little bit more about the causal schemata model. Even though it's not terribly different than the Jones and Davis model, Kelly does introduce some concepts that I think are useful to help us understand how it all works. Let me start with an example of something called the discounting principle. Let's suppose it's the day before a very important midterm exam in one of my classes. And I'm sitting in my office working on stuff and I feel this student presence looming in the doorway. And I look over and sure enough, there's a student standing there who says, Professor McAndrew. And I say, yes, student. Professor, I just want you to know that this class is the most interesting class I have ever taken in my life and I think without any question, you're the best professor I've ever had. And I just want you to know that. And the student then walks away. Well, I'm sitting there and I like what I just heard, but I can think of all kinds of reasons why the student might be telling me this. Maybe 
Uh, this really reflects the student's feelings, and it's just a coincidence that the student wanted to tell me these things the day before this major exam. But it's also possible that the student is trying to ingratiate him or herself with me because maybe they think they're not going to do so well on the exam and they want to be on my good side, or maybe they're going to follow this up in a little while with a request for an extension. The point is, I just don't really know why the student's doing what they're doing because I can think of so many possible explanations. And because there are so many possible explanations, I discount the importance of any one of them and end up not feeling terribly confident that I understand the motivation behind the student's behavior. So it's called the discounting principle because I'm uh, sort of not putting too much weight on any one explanation because there are so many possibilities. Now the augmentation principle is sort of the mirror image of that. So let's stick with the same example. I'm sitting in my office working the day before a big midterm exam and I feel a student presence in the doorway and I look up and without saying a word, the student comes running over, dumps me out of my chair, kicks me in the stomach as I'm laying on the floor and spits in my face and then says, Professor McAndrew. And I say, yes, student. I want you to know that this is the most god-awful class I've ever taken in my life, and you are the worst piece of shit of a professor I have ever seen, and I just want you to know that. And then the student storms out of my office. Well, I'm laying there on the floor wiping the spit off my face. I can think of all kinds of reasons why the student should not be doing this. The day before a big exam, they should want to stay in my good graces. And I can only think of one possible reason why the student would engage in this behavior, and that is that they really do hate me and that their behavior accurately reflects that fact. And because I can only think of one possible explanation, I augment the strength of that and very firmly and confidently conclude that that is the reason for the student's behavior. So in the discounting principle, I'm feeling less confident because there are a great many different explanations. With the augmentation principle, I begin to feel more confident about my judgment because I can only think of one that works. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, how the causal scheme model, model works, but it is very similar to the Jones and Davis theory in most other respects. So finally, let's uh, consider Kelly's covariation model. This is the one where I have multiple samples of a behavior over time, and I'm trying to make some kinds of judgments about what the cause of that behavior is. Um, so let's suppose, again, using students in my class as an example, there is a student who comes to class uh, and falls asleep almost every day. And I'm trying to figure out what the cause of this is. Well, I have to look, according to Kelly, at different kinds of information. Does the student always fall asleep in my class? In other words, is the consistency high? Does the student fall asleep only in my class or does the student fall asleep in everybody else's classes as well? This is distinctiveness. To what extent is the behavior distinctively associated with a specific situation? So if the student is only falling asleep in my class and not in other classes, uh, that's an important bit of information to know. And finally, I will look at consensus. What are other students doing in this situation? Are other students falling asleep or uh, is it only this student? So according to Kelly, what we're doing in social situations is acting like a scientist. We're looking at how behavior co-varies across situations and make judgments about the causes of the behavior. So if there's a student who falls asleep in my class, doesn't fall asleep in any other classes, and all the other students are falling asleep in my class, you're going to attribute the cause of the sleeping to me for being a very boring person. On the other hand, if nobody else is falling asleep and the student falls asleep in all of the other classes that that student takes, as well as mine, then we're going to make a conclusion about there's something about this student that's primarily responsible for the sleeping behavior. Anyway, uh, there have been hundreds of studies testing 
these various attribution models. And I wouldn't be telling you about them if the research didn't uh, bear out the fact that they work pretty well. In uh, the case of Kelly's covariation model, if you present people with information about the distinctiveness, consensus, and consistency of behaviors, people do in fact make judgments exactly the way that Kelly suggested they should. Uh, in Jones Davis's theory of correspondent inferences, uh, you do see that when you give people information about others, they do weight non-normative behavior more heavily uh, and make more strongly correspondent attributions in situations where that kind of behavior is available. So the predictions of these models have worked out pretty well over time, and they've inspired uh, many variations of them um, throughout the decades since.